I mean, there are, there are obvious lessons that, 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 that we should learn from this, and I, I said the other day, and I do, I accept full responsibility without exception or excuse, but I think there are also, going forward, some very big questions for, um, for the political leadership, but also for the armed forces, as to what is our role in the world, what commitments are we prepared to make, what are the right circumstances in which we make them, who are going to be our allies in doing this, what are the right capabilities that we need for this different type of warfare that we're fighting today? Are you, are you satisfied that you've managed to put your point across and that people have understood it? Well, it's difficult <laughs> because mm. there's such a weight of, mm. um, I mean, frankly, the, the, of media disagreement, certainly with the decision. So it can be difficult, but on the other hand, that's why I did the press conference the way I did and said to the media, right, I'll stay there until... Till it's over, until yeah, all the until, questions until have run all out. all the questions are, are answered. And it's important also because I, I feel the obligation, at least that people understand, as I say, not just why I did it at the time, mm. but why I think it's important still today. The Chilcot report um, found failings in the preparation, the time that the armed forces were given to actually deploy to Iraq, the equipment that they were found to be lacking in when they were there and also the planning for afterwards. What do you think could have been done better and how would you tell a future Prime Minister, what would you say, don't do this? Um, I mean, first of all, by the way, we would never have gone in unless we were, we felt we were prepared and ready to do it. And the first part of this campaign, the removal of Saddam... Did you give the armed forces enough time to prepare? Uh, well, I, I, I asked them if they were prepared and they said they were and they were, by the way. I mean, but they have a can-do attitude, don't they? So they're they, gonna do. they might tell you what you want to hear. Well, but on the other hand, I've obviously got to, you know, it's right to ask them and it's right to hear what they say. Here's, here's what I would also offer as a lesson, because I think this goes to the heart of what we're discussing now. You can do all the planning, but in the end, it's the fighting that's going to be tough. Because however much you plan, if you have people who are prepared to drive cars with laden with explosives into markets where there are civilians and blow up the first hundred people they see, you're going to have a tough fight. What do you say to those people about their, their children's or their brother's, their sister's contribution? What I say is that they did not make that contribution or sacrifice in vain. On the contrary, mm. in my view, but look, this is a, a debate, how, how can we know? We can't know. But in my view and my judgment, at the time and now, the world was and is better off without Saddam Hussein in power now. But for those people, I mean, they who've lost their loved ones, whatever you say is not going to make it right for them and they will not be satisfied in some of their minds until they see you in The Hague tried as a war criminal. Have it's you considered that that would ever happen to you? No, but I, I do understand why they can't agree with me and, and will never forgive me for mm -hmm. this decision. But I also think you put prime ministers in these positions to take decisions and to take them in what they believe to be the best interests of the country. Now that's not to say those decisions are right, mm -hmm. but you always want your prime ministers to be sitting in that seat of decision making and doing what they think is right, because that's what you elect them to do. When I was prime minister, I mean, I came to power and never really expected to end up being a, a prime minister at a time of war. I never expected to go into conflict. I mean, I, I came in 1997 full of plans for the health service and education and all the rest of it. And in some respects, if you look at the Northern Ireland peace process, what happened in Iraq and being a prime minister presided over war, it kind of overshadowed your other achievements. Well, that's, that's the way it is. But it, it, when I did then come to be engaged in conflict, I mean, I came to have just a huge respect and admiration for the armed forces. They were the people you could depend on. They were the people that, when the going got tough, they got stood up and, and could be counted upon. And whatever people think about me and whatever members of the armed forces think about me, you know, I found them to be the most extraordinary and capable people.
It's been a fraught time for all of those who were affected by Iraq and the people I think of most are those that made the sacrifice either loss of life or got seriously injured. And one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about saying to people, this is why we did the right thing, is precisely so that these people, the people that have made that sacrifice understand that there is a, you know, when they're being told by so many people, oh, it's a waste of time, we should never have done it, it's all been a catastrophe. No, it, it, that, in my view, that is not right. And at least they should hear the other point of view because this, this sacrifice was enormous. But I did do what I thought was right. And, and, and you know, that's, that's what I've got to live with and stand by.